Hey guys, it's Ted Bogard with The Ted Show. We're back. I uh, hope and pray no technical difficulties like earlier because this is a great topic. This is a much needed topic and I'm super excited to have uh, Jane Turner on the show today. Hey Jane, how you doing? Ted, I'm great. I'm on the other side of the world. It's six o'clock in the morning here. So, oh I'm, my gosh, you're six o'clock. I'm so sorry. Where are you? I am. I'm in Sydney in Australia. So I'm bright oh. and sparky. You know, you're, you're taking wow. You, my morning you, look, walk. you look good in general, and then now you really look good at six a.m. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I love this topic. I I, I think more people need to embrace it, myself mm -hmm. included. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's such a big deal as far as moving your business to the next level. But like most of us, it can, it can be a daunting task to do that. So before we dive into that, let's learn about Jane. Tell us, tell us a little bit about you. Well, thank you, Ted. Listen, I, uh, I worked for the government here in Australia my whole working life up to the age of 52. So I was a person who loved routines. I was in my safety zone, you know, it was all good until it wasn't. At, uh, at not a young age, I was made redundant and I had to really, really work things out, work out what am I going to do. I applied for a lot of jobs. I got none of them. And there was just one thing on my side, and that was that uh, some years earlier I had a, a little bit of an awakening of sorts and I took some training as a coach. I thought uh, I've got to really get that head of mine working again. You know, I was I was atrophine, put it that way. It was all too <laughs> easy for me to just go off to an office every day to know what I would be doing, what was expected of me, what the conditions were. So there I was. I got a little out of my comfort zone. I did some <laughs> training and it woke me up, Ted. I got a sense of, you know what, there, there's more to me than I and thinking of at the moment. And perhaps 10 years down the track, I'm somebody who plays a long game, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> 10 years down the track, I imagined that my daughter would finish school. Therefore, my financial si situation, where I was really reliant on a fortnightly paycheck, would be lifted to some extent. And I had seen a lot of coaches really go to the top of the top of the pile, if you like, because they were authors. They had taken the time, put their intellectual property into a book, and that book was able to build a bridge between them and the people that they could help. So I figured, well, here I am, I'm pulling in a wage, I'm nice and comfortable, but I see a different future. Why don't I start to write a book? And at that stage, I was going into a life phase that a lot of women find difficult. You know, we call it midlife. So I started writing a book. <laughs> I started writing a book called Thrive in Midlife because I imagined myself coaching women to feel better moving into that space. If you get a handle on your your mindset, if you do some sensible things, you can How actually. You, let me ask you, Jane, because we've got a couple, and lots of people are sending you love too, by the way. Oh, thank um, you. The, I want to get into the dive on the time frame, but I want to mm -hmm. ask you, did you have writing experience before? Did you, uh, had you, you uh, always been some sort of a side writer. You had, you wrote poetry, you wrote uh, prose, you did something. Uh, were you like that or did you just go, all right, I want to write. I feel like I've got stuff. Tell, no. us, tell us the history there. And, and look, I used to write a memo. I would write uh, reports. So I, I could string a sentence together, Ted, but no, <laughs> by no means was I a writer. And I love to talk about the hero's journey that I won't go into in depth because there was no really good reason for me to get the coach training. And it was the coach training that led me to write the book. And then writing the book led me to find myself, Ted, ultimately. So there, there was no background in this regard whatsoever. So there I was, I was uh, quite green, but of course I had a very good salary coming in. So I fell prey to what a lot of people have difficulty with. And I'm writing a book about this at the moment and we call it shiny object syndrome. <laughs> so in the process of writing that first book, Ted, I racked up about a $30,000 debt in relation to various writing programs and retreats and coaching and things like that. And um, as I mentioned, I talk about the hero's journey and in the hero's journey, there's always a crisis point. And that's often the place where the hero finds themselves. 
And if you think about Star Wars, which is a classic hero's journey, you'll um, possibly remember Luke Skywalker and that moment where he had to recognise that Darth Vader was his father. Right. And not only that, but Darth Vader was the, the dark part of himself that he didn't want to own. So for me, not only was my first book a $30,000 uh, journey, it was also a five-year journey. And this was a, a book that really I could I could put together in perhaps eight weeks, perhaps at the time five months, if I didn't have a mindset that was then playing interference on me. And my most recent book is Mindset for Authors, How to Overcome Perfectionism, Procrastination and Self-Doubt. And it's no accident that I've written a book like that because those were the things <laughs> that took me the five years. But back to the hero's journey, the fact yeah, of the Talk about years, that. Also, the, the, the problem for me, my Darth Vader, um, on the surface looked like that, yes, I've been investing five years of my time, $30,000. I've just been made redundant. By that stage, I'm 52 and uh, I still don't have a book. And what's more, that plan, the game plan I had for getting my daughter through school before I took a risk and started coaching professionally, um, that, that, was pulled out from under me because she was several years short of, uh, of leaving school. So in classic hero's journey style, I had to get so uncomfortable that there was no option but to get out of my own way and to get it done. And one of the incredible gifts from that discomfort, and we talk about gifts, we talk about rewards, this is hero's journey language. One of the incredible gifts was that I got very, very clear about what the main barriers are, what the what the barriers are for me and what they were for all of the other people I talked about who were either writing books or had written books or wanted to write a book. And those five barriers are what I now base my business around. And I'll get to that in a moment, Ted, because I really want to value add for anybody listening who wants to uh, write a book themselves. But I had an absolutely cathartic moment when I was on stage launching that book. And my Darth Vader moment actually wasn't just because it was five years and $30,000 and I'm made redundant and I still don't have a book. The real Darth Vader moment for me was that I had a 40-year history of binge eating disorder and I was trying to outrun that. I slightly misunderstood the hero that I was meant to be. I thought I was meant to be able to say that after doing all this beautiful self-care, after all the eating well to the best of my ability under the circumstances, after all the eating well, managing my sleep, managing my mindset, all of the things that I included in that first book that I wrote, I thought I could come out the other side and say, and now, I don't even find myself drawn to numbing my feelings using food anymore. But as Darth Vader does, that was not the case. The case was I had to finish that book when I still had that problem. Now, I'm a person with a high value on integrity, so there's no way I could have not mentioned the single most defining characteristic in my life at the time. But I've watched some of your other shows, Ted, and I've noticed some of the other people are talking about that voice in the head, the little voice in the head. Yes, lots of voices. Oh, yes. At one stage it was saying to me, but who's going to want to read a book by you? You're not an expert. Nobody's, nobody's heard from you. And, Ted, you're not even a good writer. And, uh, of course, the Isn't other it terrible people, that we do that to ourselves? Oh, I mean, it's, it's just so uncommon. But, but but the, uh, but the question I have for you at that point, as you're as you're listening to that voice, what was it that finally? Because I think people get to that point where they're tired of arguing with the voice, mm -hmm. and so they don't make that next step because they just give up because they're exhausted by it and they don't have an answer for it. How did you find your answer? Well, finding my answer started with finding out about the hero's journey. Because the hero's journey teaches us a couple of things, well, many things, but two of the important things in this context is that it taught me that any of those barriers actually weren't meant to stop me. They were meant to help me become the person I needed to become to do the, the important work that I was put on this earth to do. And as I say, when I was launching the first book, I had a cathartic moment on the stage and I looked, I, I had not planned to do this, 
in the way of launching the book. But whilst I was up there, the, the, the moment grabbed me and I looked at my 14-year-old daughter who was in the audience and her 14-year-old friends that she bought and I said, what I want you girls to know is that there is nothing so broken, so shameful or so unlovable about you that you can't tell someone about it and know that they will still love you. And, you know, Ted, it wasn't just those 14-year-old girls who needed to hear that. There was a 14-year-old girl in here who had been knocking on that door for a while. Uh And, listen, the other great thing about the hero's journey is, yes, you kind of, you're prepared in a sense. If you know about it, you know, okay, it's not necessarily easy, but that's a good way. I mean, that's a good thing in a sense because I do need to get out of this place where I had not given myself permission, right. you know? And and that's the other thing about the hero's journey. When you're in that most uncomfortable place, the little voice in your head might actually flip. Mine did. Mine flipped and it was no longer saying, you're not good enough. Who wants to read your book? Who would want a broken coach like you, a disgusting, broken human being who can't even control what they eat? That little voice didn't say that, Ted. That little voice said, What's, what if that's not what it's all about? And, of course, the what it was all about was being an example of somebody who had hidden, hidden who they were because they hated who they were for 52 years of their life. And, wow. In did, class- you know, did you know that you hated who you were? Uh, yes, certainly from the point of the coach training. That was when the onion skin started to come off. So the idea of writing a book, you know, as strategically important as it was in the scheme of things, the idea of writing the book was giving me a safe place to unpack my story, Ted. And when I started writing the book, I was okay about saying things like I have an emotional eating problem or I have a sugar addiction, calling it what it was was a very different matter. I should say calling it what it was in the present tense was a very different matter. I was wanting to write the book and be able to say, I used to have binge eating disorder. And on the stage, when I was launching that book, I got to see that I was not defined by that problem. That problem was a gift in disguise and coming out the other side of the hero's journey, of course, beyond the crisis point, not only did I get to finish my book, not only did I get to see how I could help other people to do the same thing, but some amazing doors opened up for me, Ted. I was invited to speak on a a stage in an international forum that over 2,000 women went to And this came by way of, and this is a a story I love to share by way of motivation for people who are thinking that they might like to write a book. I was emailed one day from the organisers of the Women's Economic Forum saying that one of our members has read your book and said that we should invite you to come to our next event, which was in that case, it was in, in India in 2017. I jumped on a plane. I didn't know what I was up for. And... That event, speaking at that event, changed my life just as much as writing that book did. Well, you took that um, first step with the book, mm, Jane, and that's what I think people get caught. They don't realize Mm. that there's a level that goes beyond once you become an author, once you have a book, a real book that you put Mm. out there and it begins to resonate with people, then it's an exponential impact. Um, And in your case, almost an immediate impact of how it can change the trajectory of even a successful business or a desire to have a more successful business. And you you proved all of that right and continue to take the steps. So I, I was thinking your next question might be, well, what was the first step? What can we help? That was people? 1,000% my next question. <laughs> Sorry, I jumped in. I it. But, all right, um, I like it. The thing, of course, I know now I'm on my fourth book. I'm working with other authors to write their book. And what I would say is start with the end in mind. Get a very clear picture of your reader. Who are they? What do they care about? What do they want more of in their life? 
What do they want less of in their life? And think about how your book can help them to achieve those things. And it's essentially getting out of your own head and into the head of your target audience because we will, we don't want to write a book for people just like us. Although, in fact, our target audience is experienced, for the most part, experiencing the problem that we were, in my case, five years earlier when I first started. You know, I'm now 10 years down the track from there. But uh, at, at the beginning, the, the target audience was uh, was who I was five years earlier. So think about that. Think about what they care about and why they should bother to read your book. And I, in, in addition to Hero's Journey, I love learning styles and in particular, I love the format, Bernice McCarthy's take on learning styles. And I help my authors to unpack the information out of their head onto the page by way of asking four key questions that are based on learning styles theory. And one of them is, you know, if I'm a reader, why should I read this book? What's in it for me? Why does it matter that what you that I take on board what you're sharing? So you have the why learners. You have also your what learners. And these people love details. They will want to know what specifically am I going to find in this book. They love dot points and graphs and statistics. They love case studies. In fact, almost all of the learners love case studies. And that's another tip for, for people here looking to write a book to build their business. You, know, you want to share a little bit about yourself, but more to the point, you want to share some case studies you want to give your readers a sense that you do know and understand them well and that you have worked with people like them who have got results like the reader is, is wanting to get for themselves. So that's your, um, your what learners, your how learners are the people who are the, they're the doers. They're the ones in a workshop who are going to really jump up as soon as the facilitator says, what we're going to do now is break into a group of three and one of you will practice being the coach and one will be the client, and one will be the observer. Now, personally, I'm not a how learner and that used to drive me nuts whenever <laughs> I was in the training. I was thinking, get on with it. Can we what just- What kind of learner are you? I'm very much a why learner. Now, a lot why of- learner cut across, you know, we'll cut across, we'll recognise <laughs> some of the learning styles, but there'll be some that feel quite alien and, and the, the how, how learners is to me, but with a how learner. Uh, and a lot of my my um, authors are coaches. So in a lot of the times, for the how learners, what they need to say is something like, for you to get the most out of the material that I'm sharing with you here, I want you to get out of your comfort zone. Be prepared to change. Be prepared to just be a little bit brave and realise that if you don't, you will continue to be experiencing the problem you're experiencing now. Something like that. That's that's what a how learner needs to um, needs to hear. Yeah. And then we have the uh, the what if learner and addressing the needs of a what if learner are, are about becoming good at handling objections really because the what if learner they they have two aspects to them they're the most creative people in the world generally but also they will be thinking as you're sharing a strategy with them they'll be thinking okay what if I do that part of the strategy but not this part what if I don't do it that way but I do it this way now, the, um, that's, that's the upside of the creativity of the, um, the what if learners. The downside of it is that they can be the very best procrastinators in the world because they may be also thinking, what if I don't do it at all? What if I do all of the rest? And I, I was a little bit, little bit what if when I was writing Thriving Midlife and I was having that, that real difficulty about my identity and owning even the ugly parts or what I what I identified as the ugly parts of myself. Of course, when I was writing the um, the chapter on food and trying to put myself through um, healthy eating strategies and making some ground, but for short periods of time, you know, the the problem I had that I couldn't really solve until I was prepared to own it kept emerging so that I would be writing in books um, or thinking that, look, I'll just make this a short chapter. You know, what if I don't make it as good as, of a chapter as the other ones? What if this is just a short one? What if it's full of other people's case studies and I just skip over my own? So there's a little bit of the, the and not, not uncommon in fact, that there's a bit of the what if learner in the why learner. 
And if we think about this as a quadrant, when you look at the top right-hand quadrant, that's where the Y learner will be. And then if you go clockwise around and you're at the bottom, that's your what learner. And a little further around, you have your how learner. And then back at the left-hand top of that square, you've got your, um, your what if learner. So those things, knowing about the hero's journey, learning about learning styles, and the big one for me and the reason I wrote the book, Mindset for Authors, How to Overcome Perfectionism, Procrastination and Self-Doubt, that was the big one for me. So for your listeners who are looking to read the book, really get a handle on what is stopping you. And you don't just ask that question because the mind's a tricky thing. It'll go, oh, too busy. <laughs> too busy is common. Um, don't have enough information yet. I've got people who research and research and research. They've come to me. They've done 10 years' worth of research. Or I've got other people who just write. They don't do the thinking. They don't do thinking about the reader, the end in mind, and come back from that. I've got a 90 5,000 word manuscript on my desk at the moment, which really, in terms of a coaching book, a how to book, you, oh, you don't yeah. want to go over about 40,000 words. You can, um, and well known people certainly have the freedom to do that with people who are just building their profile, um, a, a very efficient way to get your message across to your audience. And you're essentially building a bridge between yourself and your audience. To do that, 40,000 words is perfect. So I have a, a massive editing job on my hands at the moment. Okay. I'm co-creating. I guess you do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. Let me I ask you, I, we had lots, we've had lots of people who, before we went live, asking this one main question, it seems like. All right, I've got an idea, Jane. Can you help me? And how can you help me? get it to fruition um, because I think people have heard things like ghostwriter and they've heard uh, different terms and things. But if somebody's got this really great idea, can they come to you for help? Absolutely. And the idea is the beginning. So yay, if you have the idea, that was a thumbs up, by the way, two thumbs up. If you've got the idea, that's fabulous. Yes. What, what I do then is that I actually ask a number of questions and in the arena of coaching, and I'm, I'm a book writing coach, so I haven't moved from coaching. I just have quite, quite a different slant on it to what I thought I would be having. But the idea is that I then ask a lot of questions to get absolute clarity around how this book needs to be structured, how we take the idea and we chunk it down for the reader to be able to understand. So a simple idea is often, uh, a, a strategy. It breaks down into a strategy. So I often actually get people, Ted, who haven't started their coaching business yet. They're looking, they don't know consciously that what they're doing is actually unpacking all of their ideas to get the structure for themselves to construct a coaching package out of the book. So it's about which is the chicken and which is the egg, actually, uh, in some cases. Okay. Other cases, I have very, very established coaches who in many ways are too close to, they are too expert at what they do because they can't see it. And I'll, I'll say, look, can you just explain that to me? And they'll say, well, explain what? <laughs> I just made this simple point and I said it was simple to you. Harry or Bruce or whoever it might be. It was very simple to you and that's your superpower. The person reading the book is, is needing you to really explain. That's what it's about, really, um, Ted. It's about you've got the idea. Take it from idea to the page is that you've got to explain. Why does it matter? What is it? How does the reader implement it? How do they benefit from your idea? And what, what if they don't? What can you say to them will be the consequences of them not doing it? Uh, so that's, you know, the idea. Idea is a brilliant thing. Idea can become your biggest pest. It's that little voice in the head saying, yeah, where's that book? Where's that book? Where Got is it? Book. From I the want to know where it is. I think people, I think mm -hmm. what you've done today is well, certainly motivating me um, because I, I feel like there's a lot of us out there that ha believe we have a lot to say, believe mm -hmm. we have a good idea, um, a solid idea, 
But as far as putting it down for words that make sense, I think that's where the challenge comes in. And then people spend way too much time worrying about it, that it's not going to make sense, that they don't do anything and become paralyzed. So if somebody has an idea, Jane, if somebody wants to reach out to you, if somebody wants to buy your books, if they want to learn from you or, or mm -hmm. maybe uh, get, engage you as a coach, what is the best way for them to reach you? Well, if they go to www.writewithjane.com and, and give me their email address, the very first thing they will get from me is a copy of Mindset for Authors, How to Overcome Perfectionism, Procrastination and Self-Doubt. That's my gift to your your um, audience, Ted, for taking that Wonderful. first step. So there's an incentive. And this is me actually walking the talk. This is me using my book, that particular book, as my business card. So that will be the very first thing that happens when they sign up. The second thing that happens is they get a link to my diary and a complimentary strategy session. And we, we talk about that idea. Bring me your ideas. There will never be too many ideas in this world we live in, especially now, Ted. When we look at what's going on now, it is people like us who, you know, one, one book at a time, one sentence at a time, one, you know, great intention at a time. We, we need to be putting that energy out there into the world. And uh, I had one person rattle my cage. He, he was a very savvy, one of those very, very experienced coaches. And he came on to one of those uh, introductory calls with me and he said, I just need to tell you one thing. I don't, I don't believe this thing about books. Books don't pe change people's lives. Wow. And I said, okay, let's say that's the truth. Um, then what? <laughs> And, uh, and I said, it depends. Let's define changing people's lives. Let's say, for example, the fact that I'm reading, um, I'm reading Atomic Habits at the moment. Anybody who's heard, who's heard of Atomic Habits, it's, it's a bestseller. Um, this guy has built not, not only a business, a lifestyle. He is working in his passion. I hear it in the audio book that I'm listening to. I see it on the pages of the book that he's written. How is his book changing my life? He's he's finally gotten through to me. I'm now not 52 anymore. Many years have passed. He's finally gotten through to me about the incremental steps, the little changes that we make that seem unimportant, that just with financial planners, they'll tell you the, the benefit of compound interest. Finally, through reading Atomic Habits, I get that if I get out that door every morning and walk for half an hour, then I'm not, I'm less likely to be one of those older people that you see who are more or less in their, you know, needing their little, auto, you know, oh, I'm losing my words now, you know, those little machines that they might be driving down the footpath in. Um, I see older people right. who are very, you know, still going to the gym and what have you. I, I may never be a gym junkie, but if I just keep moving, and thank you, James Clear, for Atomic Habits, because if I've heard that one time, I've probably heard it a thousand times. But now it's... But he finally read So we never know. We never know who our book is going to touch and in what, what way. And we probably don't have time for another story, but... I was, I realised that I, my first book, Thrive in Midlife, and I often say I wrote the wrong book. That was a great book if I was going to build a coaching practice around helping women through midlife. But, you know, it, it wasn't to be, but that was not the wrong book because it turned me into the person I needed to be. And somebody reached out to me to tell me that that saved their life. And just very Isn't quickly. that amazing? Very quickly, she was a heroin junkie. She was in hospital looking to get a, um, being assessed for a liver transplant and somebody gave her the book. And when they wanted the wow. book back, she said, I've only got about 10 pages more, but I don't want to finish it. And what that meant was that possibly for the first time in her life, she felt understood because she saw that someone like me had essentially exactly the same problem as she had. And that I had found a way to be okay about myself. My, what I did with food was no different to what she did with heroin. She did it for decades. I did it for decades. She impacted her body. I impacted my body. And if that one person 
is the only person who was moved by that book, I would write it a hundred times over. And that's uh, that's pretty much brought me to the point of why nice. why I do. Mm, that's why I do what I do. Well, you're you're awesome. I, I want more. I want I want you to come back on and we'll figure out how and why. Uh, but I've got some ideas, Jane. That was amazing. So writewithjane.com is there at the bottom. Please reach out to her. Um, it's 6 a.m. there, so try not to do anything past 5 o'clock. I don't know what time you want them. Uh, but please reach oh, out to her. I think that is, I think your insights were phenomenal. Thank you so much. That was awesome, really. All right. You were. We did. You did phenomenal. Thank you, too. All right. Everybody say bye, Jane. Bye, guys. Thank you so much, Jane Turner. We'll talk to you guys soon. See you guys later tomorrow. Uh, reach out to Jane. I know you have an idea. You want to see it born. I know it because I do. <laughs>